on behalf of the CSU and on behalf of ASFA, on behalf of Concordia University, the Concordia Council of Student Life, and on behalf of Yves Rocher, I would like to welcome you to the public lecture given by Dr. Wangara Matai. First, to speak to you. <laughs> I would like to introduce uh, the Arts and Science Federation of Students. They will come to the podium and to talk to you about ASFA. Thank you. ASFA, in collaboration with the CSU, is proud to present to you Dr. Wangari Matai. She, she is a leader in uh, sustainability, and uh, she has inspired many. And uh, with this speech, we're sure that she's going to inspire many more. Uh, for those of you who don't know what ASFA is, ASFA stands for the Arts and Science Federation of Associations. It basically represents 18,000 students in 30 different faculties, uh, departments. Sorry. This year, ASFA will be celebrating its ninth year, and since its creation, we have seen a growing trend in students demanding for more sustainable actions on campus. This was made clear when uh, last year we held a referendum asking for a uh, VP sustainability position. It passed, and this year we are proud to actually have a VP sustainability. Um, we, the ASFA executives, are proud to uphold that mandate and serve this positive trend. As such, we have introduced a brand new concept entitled the Green Week. This event will be organized by students for students and it'll happen in the first week of November. It'll basically be entirely dedicated to sustainable living and creating awareness on critical ecological issues affecting not just us as students, but us as humans. This event will be a free uh, for all students and it'll involve many events such as a permaculture workshop, a uh, plant market at the greenhouse, a veggie food festival, a sustainable job fair, uh, the screening of a movie, um, a speech by a notorious environmentalist, so I'll keep this as a secret, but we have uh, different options, uh, and obviously a fundraising event for the environment. Uh, I encourage all of you to attend and participate in such critical times It'll be a month before the Copenhagen conference, and I really encourage all of you guys to actually attend. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'll, uh, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Louise Britzel Bauer. Board member of Thank Good afternoon. Thanks, Adrian. The Sustainability Action Fund is honored to welcome Dr. Matai, whose leadership and innovation is a true inspiration. One of Dr. Matai's many achievements was her establishment of the Green Belt Movement, a women's organization based in Kenya that seeks to empower communities worldwide to protect the environment and promote peaceful democratic change. The Sustainability Action Fund is proud to be a part of the rich myriad of campus grassroots initiatives and also strives to ensure that our common future will be a peaceful and pro prosperous one. The SAF was founded through the 1% campaign at the Let's Talk, More Action Youth Summit held in March 2007. At this event, Dr. David Suzuki and Mr. Al Gore inspired Concordia students to vote yes to donate 1% of their tuition fees towards sustainable projects. Through March 27th to 29th, students voted overwhelmingly to support the Sustainability Action Fund. The SAF is funded by a 25 cent per credit student fee levy and totals approximately $150,000 uh, per year. These monies go to support sustainable infrastructure, student-driven projects, and to inspire a culture of sustainability at Concordia. All community members can apply to the Sustainability Action Fund as long as the projects uh, directly benefit the Concordia community. Project proposals are reviewed and approved through a multi-step process. All project leaders should first consult with me as soon as possible. Project leaders will then be required to present their project to Concordia students and to the SAF Board of Directors at the public consultations, which will be held on Thursday, October 22nd. 
The feedback from the Concordia community should help project leaders make adjustments and put the finishing touches on their special project applications, which are due on November 5th. The Special Projects Committee will then make their decision based on the feedback received at the public consultations and the feasibility of the project. I would like to emphasize that the SAF hopes to fund projects that contribute to different types of sustainability, uh, environmental, social, or economic. Students from all disciplines should think about how their work might be eligible for special projects funding. Some of the projects that have been funded in the past include the People's Potato Garden Project, which distributes organic vegetables to students and community members who wouldn't otherwise have access to them, a partnership with Reggie's Bar to uh, purchase an energy efficient dishwasher and a thousand glass cups, the Pistol Press Anthology, which promotes the work of emerging artists uh, and is published on 100% post-consumer paper using vegetable inks, the R4 Free Dish Project, which provides reusable dishes to groups for campus events, and a partnership with Art Matters to print their festival guide and promotional, promotional material on 100% post-consumer paper. The message I want you to go home with is that if you have a great idea for a project but you don't have the means to complete it, then the Sustainability Action Fund is precisely here for that purpose. If you have any questions, please contact me at safconcordia at gmail.com or by phone at 514-2424, extension 5138. You can also visit us on the web at www.saf.concordia.ca. And if you're on Facebook, you can join the Sustainability Action Fund Facebook group. And now I'll turn it back over to Prince Ralph. Thank you for your time and enjoy the lecture. Hello everyone. Um, Excellence, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. My name is Amin Dabshi and I'm the president of the Concordia Student Union. Um, I would like uh, to address a very warm welcome and thank you to uh, our honorable guest, Dr. Wangari Matai, for uh, coming all the way from Kenya to Montreal to speak to us. Thank you very much. for the hard work they put through, to thank the ASFA executive, to thank the Sustainability Action Fund, Concordia University as a whole, the Climate Project Canada, with his representative Peter Chivki, our surprise guest who is honoring us by his presence here, Dr. David Suzuki. <laughs> And uh, last, but not least, the CSU staff and volunteers. Thank you all. So, Dr. Matai is uh, the first, yes, the first Nobel Peace Prize laureate to speak here at Concordia in the H110. And, and more than that, she is the first African woman to speak here at Concordia, and as an African, I am very, very proud to announce that. So, Dr. Matai symbolizes all what Concordia believes in. She symbolizes the values and ideals that Concordia Student Union share. Social justice and sustainability. Concordia University is well known across Canada for its sustainable advancements and for its green initiatives, right? Concordia as well is well known for the multitude of groups on campus that advocate for sustainability. And I'm thinking of the Sustainability Action Fund, Sustainable Concordia, People's Potato, Frigo Vert, Cooper, Cinema Politica, etc., etc. So it's in the same spirit that the CSU created a few years ago a position, which is the CSU VP Sustainability, he or she 
is the roving ambassador of the CSU in terms of green initiatives. And our project, our big project this year, is the Green Month that we're having in the month of January. Uh, banning water bottles on campus is one of the leading projects we are working currently with other organizations. So, I wanna ask you guys a question. What comes generally to mind when we think about the environment? Okay. Well, is it about planting trees? Is it about saving the planet? But not only that, the environment is everything that surrounds you. The environment is your university, the environment is your community, your friends, your family. So climate change and global warming are issues that touch every single aspect of our life. So as a student in economics, I was always taught that, you know, the economy grows perpetually and definitively. But the political science that I am will tell you this is not true. Why? I will also say that by an example, by actually a quote of uh, Geronimo, which says that when the last tree will die, when the last river will dry, when the last fish will be fished, then we will then realize that money is not eatable. So in order to face our difficult challenge, we have to work toward these goals. And how? We can start by getting involved here, today, at Concordia, in the many, many organizations we have. So please, please get involved. As the French poet Alfred de Musset said, qu'importe le flacon, pourvu qu'on ait l'ivresse, which means that it is not the packaging that matters, but the content of your involvement. And this reminds me of a, of a beautiful Japanese story that I stole from Dr. Mat one of Dr. Matai's speech, the hummingbird story. For those who don't know the hummingbird story, it's one day in this forest in Japan, the forest was on fire, and all the animals escaped the forest, ran away from the, from the forest, and watched the forest burn. So, except of one animal, the hummingbird, the little hummingbird, that tried to do something about it. So the hummingbird was going to the estuary, to the lake, getting a drop of water, and going back to the forest and putting water. And they get back and forth, doing hours and hours, and days and ways, while the elder animals were trying to discourage him. What are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? You will never succeed. But the hummingbird said, I'm only doing the best I can. So please, today, I want you all to be hummingbirds. Thank you very much. Good afternoon once again. I, uh, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Wangari Matai. Wangari Matai was born in 1940 in the village of Rural, Kenya, to a humble family. She received a scholarship from the Kennedy administration to study in the United States. She earned her degree in biological sciences in Kansas and her PhD in veterinary medicine at the University of Nairobi. At younger than 30 years old, Matai was the first woman from East or Central Africa to receive a doctorate degree. <laughs> After completing her education, she became active in Kenyan politics. In 2004, Wangari Matai became an internationally recognized figure by becoming the first black woman and the first environmentalist to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Dr. Matai is best known as the founder of the Green Belt Movement, GBM for short, an initiative to plant trees in, forest, in forested areas of Kenya that were being striped for commercial expansion. 
Critics wondered whether a tree planter was truly a peace activist. For Matai, there was an important link between the environment and peace. Peace on earth depends on our ability to secure our living environment. Dr. Matai stands at the front of the fight to promote ecologically viable social, economic, and cultural development in Kenya and Africa. She has taken a holistic approach to sustainable development that embraces democracy, human rights, and women's rights in particular. She thinks globally and acts locally. She developed the idea of planting trees as a means to improve communities. She started by planting a, a simple seven tree in her own backyard on World Environmental Day. The project quickly expanded. She organized women groups to plant trees with a common goal of improving life for locals, especially women. The Green Belt Movement, as the project came to be known, had a simple objective, plant trees. Through the planting of trees, she has allowed women to take back the lives they once felt they had lost. She herself has represented the power women can have in political matters. The Green Belt Movement has moved Kenya much closer to the acceptance of full equality for women. Today, ladies and gentlemen, over 40 million trees have been planted through the help of the Green Belt Movement. It has spread to over 30 countries and has proven to be one of the most successful environmental and community development projects ever in history. Professor Matai is internationally recognized for her persistent struggle for democracy, human rights, and environmental conservation. She has addressed the United Nations on several occasions and spoke on behalf of women at special section, sessions of the General Assembly during the five-year review of the ELF Summit. She served on the Commission for Global Governance and the Commission on the Future. She and the Green Belt Movement have received numerous awards. Upon hearing the news that she had won the Nobel Peace Prize, she quickly left the house and planted, went for a walk and planted a tree. To me, she represents an example and a source of inspiration for everyone in Africa fighting for sustainable development, democracy, and peace. Without further ado, Dr. Wangari Matai, Asante Karibu Sana. very much. You are most kind. And I'm deeply humbled. When I came in and saw the picture, I said, who is that? <laughs> I want to deeply appreciate uh, the warm welcome and the invitation, warm invitation by the Concordia Student Union. And I know there is a, a group of very large group of students who have really worked very hard to get this done. And I also want to thank the university uh, for, their, for supporting them. I want to recognize the presence of the Right Honorable Premier of Quebec, uh, the Honorable John Charest. I have been practicing so that I do not make a mistake. <laughs> uh, the, and the people from the government of Quebec who are here. I want to also recognize the presence of the Honorable Minister for Environment, Mr. the Honorable Mr. Boucher. Boucher. Is that correct? <laughs> and I want to recognize and really appreciate the presence of Dr. David Suzuki. <laughs> And I also want to recognize the, uh, the Jean Swaff Foundation that I understand has been extremely supportive in 
helping me to come here and be able to, to spend this evening with you. I want to recognize the presence of the professors and the entire student community and members of the public who are here tonight. For me, um, it is uh, a great honor and privilege also to be able to address young people. And I'm always very happy and do my best to accept invitations that come from colleges and universities because I know I will be talking to young people who will be more or less my age when I was in the university in the United States of America. And I was there in the 60s during the struggles of Martin Luther King and others. And I must say that had I gone perhaps to the United States of America any other time, I would probably not have been as transformed as I was. So that by the time I left uh, the United States and went back to Kenya, I was um, very committed to human rights issues. Not so much to the environment, but to human rights issues. And I was very happy when I went back home. Uh, and by then, uh, our country had become independent. And, and I was very happy to be able to join in and start to participate in the development of our country. Shortly after that, unfortunately, we resorted back to very dictatorial tendencies. And eventually, those of you who have read the books that we have recently released, The Unbound and The Challenges for Africa, you have seen that we spent most of our time not really planting trees, but uh, trying to fight off a government that was trying to prevent us from taking care of the environment. Now, when uh, the Norwegian Nobel Committee in 2004 announced that, they, uh, that we had been recognized for our work and had been given the Norwegian Nobel Committee uh, for Peace, the Norwegian Nobel uh, Prize for Peace, we were not very surprised, not as much as many other people were surprised. We were surprised by the fact that the committee had recognized that peace can come from preempting causes of conflict. Because what we had been talking about and what we had been experiencing in our country is that as population increases, and right now we are approaching a billion worldwide and 40 million in Kenya, as population increases, the resources do not expand always. And therefore, there is constant competition for these resources. And often we enter into conflict because we want to prevent the other person from accessing those, those resources, controlling those resources. And in our part of the world, we were fighting over water. We were fighting over grazing land. We were fighting over agricultural land. We were fighting over forest, and we were fighting over open spaces in cities. And when I say we were fighting, sometimes it was peasant farmers who were fighting against each other. And in order for you to be able to put the other person down and to reduce their claim for these resources, you find reasons to do that. You think you... Um, justify in your own mind that that person shouldn't be part of uh, the people sharing the resources because you, in our situation, we are all black, so it's very easy to say they belong to another tribe. Uh, and that's a very good and legitimate reason for you to exclude them. Or they speak another language, or they are very dark, or they are very brown. Anything that will help you justify in your mind. Globally, it is very easy to say they belong to another religion. They belong to another race. There is always a reason why we want to marginalize, we want to exclude, we want to violate the rights of the other. And these are often the reasons why we go to war. And if you think of any war we are fighting today, whether we are fighting it locally or we are fighting it regionally, and in, in my part of the world, we have many conflicts. You will find that there is not a single conflict, whether it is in Darfur, or in Rwanda, or in Kenya last year, or in Sierra Leone, 
or in the Congo that is not over resources. So what the Norwegian Nobel Committee was trying to say and used our work to pass the message and it hoped that I would talk about it wherever I go is that if we want to live in peace in the future with the population that we have, with the limited resources that we have on this planet, we need to learn to respect our diversity. We need to learn to respect each other as we are, to respect each other's rights and privileges, and to embrace wherever we are our responsibilities so that we can preempt the reasons why we will fight, we will go to war with each other. And if we don't, well, if we don't, we will continue fighting. And some of us will lose and some others may gain. But in the end, we may not have peace on this planet. Now, when we started planting trees, <clears throat> actually, it was almost by accident. I started, first of all, I wasn't interested in planting trees. <laughs> I was in the University of Nairobi and I was teaching microanatomy. And I would go to the field and collect ticks because I wanted to know to what extent ticks, thank you very much. I wanted to know to what extent ticks were infected with a disease that was devastating for hybrid cattle in East Africa or along the eastern coast of Africa. The disease is called East Coast Fever. And it, the parasite is lodged in the salivary glands of ticks. And it is passed when the tick gets blood from cattle and behaves more or less like malaria. And so I would go into the field, I would load many pig ticks and bring them back into the laboratory and cut them up and look at their tissues under the microscope and see if I could get the parasite trans traveling between the, the gut and the slivery glands. I never did, but in the meantime, <laughs> I observed that during the rains, the livers would be brown or red with silt. And when I was growing up in the same region, the rivers would be virtually black because they have black stone or black soil at the bottom. And the water would be so clean. I used to go to the river and fetch water and bring it to my mother and we would drink it. We didn't have to boil it. It was so clean. So when I would see rivers that were brown or red with silt, I knew something very drastic was happening. And I started asking why. And then in the year 1975, the United Nations responded to a cry from women that we needed a United Nations conference on women. And the United Nations organized a meeting in Mexico. Very few of you will have been born by then, so I do not even ask how many of you went to Mexico. <laughs> and the whole world, in the whole world, women were preparing to go to Mexico. And we were developing our agendas. And my agenda, I was in the University of Nairobi, I was a member of the Kenya Association of University Women, and my agenda was I needed to go to Mexico and let the rest of the world know that in the University of Nairobi, women do not get the same terms of service as their male colleagues. That they do the same work, but they get less money. And I had a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> so when I went to the meeting to prepare for Mexico, that's the agenda I had. But when I went there, 
I listened to other women because the forum was all women of Kenya. And the women that drew my attention were the women from the countryside, the women who were partly responsible for those rivers that were brown or red with silt because they had clear cut a lot of the land to plant cash crops, tea, coffee, flowers for export. And because they wanted to be rich very quickly, they cut everything. So a lot of the bushes and forests and woodlots that I knew as a child had been clear cut and had been replaced with the cash crops. So the women we are talking about, we don't have enough food because they have put every piece of land on cash crop and you don't eat coffee. You can only drink it. <laughs> so they were saying they needed adequate food, they needed a lot of food, that they were feeding their children with a lot of starches and therefore they were suffering from diseases associated with malnutrition. And that's really what triggered me. And I'm telling you this story because quite often in life you never know what triggers you? That was for me my trigger. And I started asking, why would a country which was so fertile only a few years ago, while I was growing up, now become a piece of land where children are suffering from diseases associated with malnutrition? So that started me off on a campaign. And I told the women, why don't we plant trees? Because if you plant trees, you will have firewood, you will protect your soils, we will no longer have red rivers, you will have food, and <clears throat> you'll be able to sell the, some of these trees after some time because they grow very fast. Because in the tropics, you know, trees don't go to sleep like they do here in winter. <laughs> they are growing all the time, day and night almost. So they grow very fast. In about 10 years, 20 years, you have big trees, and in 30 years you can harvest. So I said, let us plant trees. The women told me we don't know how to plant trees. Because at that time, up to that time, the land had been plenty, very few people, no cash crop, just little pieces of um, land was needed to produce food for the few populations. So people <clears throat> did not need to have they, they had a lot of woodlots. So I, when I said, let us therefore go to the forest, go to the foresters and ask them to teach us how to plant trees. Uh, and I said, I'm not a forester either. So I'll go to the forest. So I went to the, to the conservator of forest. Now, what I did not know that our foresters were not actually trained to conserve forests. They were trained to establish monocultures of trees, such as the eucalyptus, which they brought from Australia, as if we had any kangaroos in Kenya. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, the, the needle trees from the Northern Hemisphere. These were the trees <clears throat> that we actually brought into the country to develop the colony. And because these trees were well known, they had been studied well in the north and in the south, they were planted in the highlands. And they, they literally cut, clear cut, indigenous forests, put them on fire, and replaced them with monocultures. At that time, I was very young. I remember the bonfires, but I did not have any idea the damage they were doing. So anyway, when I went to the foresters and I told them that we wanted to plant trees with the women, he's, they asked me, do they have a diploma? I said, no, of course they don't have a diploma. <laughs> he said, people without a diploma cannot plant trees. <laughs> I said, how come? All you, do, all you need to do is dig a hole. Do you need a <laughs> So anyway, to cut a long story short, 
They showed us some basics, like how do you collect the seeds, the seeds grow on trees, and when they are ready, just like other seeds, they dry up, they fall, or you can, they get picked by the wind, or you can pick them and put them in the soil. If they are blown by the wind, you have to know where they went so that when it rains, they will germinate and you can separate them from the weeds and you can collect them as wildlings. If their fruits are picked by <clears throat> the birds, then you have to negotiate with the birds and see where they will do their thing. <laughs> and there, if you go, they will do the droppings, and quite often where they do the droppings, the trees will germinate when it rains. Otherwise, you collect the seeds and you put them in the ground when they are dry. And if they are good, they will germinate. If they are no good, they will not. And so we actually learned by doing uh, to collect seeds and to, to follow the seeds until they become seedlings, then we would transplant them in containers, often plastic bags, and we would nurture them until they were about a foot or two feet, about a meter even, and then we would transplant them on farms. Fortunately, in Kenya, we had land ownership, so everybody was planting trees on their land. Now, in our part of the world, it is the men who own the land, but it's the women who work on the land. So the women would plant the trees. Now, I have never met anybody, any man who said, don't plant trees. But sometimes people have said, now how come the men allow the women to plant the trees on their land? Well, the men don't use the land. The man, for the men, the land is an estate that they can always dispose of and make money. But they also discovered later on that the trees can also improve the value of the estate. If you plant a lot of trees, the land value increases. So here came the men at the nursery also to collect the trees to go and plant because they could see, they could easily calculate that in another 30 years they can sell the trees and also their land will uh, have more value. So I said, well, that's pretty good. If you can make the men come to the nursery and collect trees and go and plant them, whatever you can make, what, whatever it takes to make them work, do it. Okay, come, take the trees and plant and improve your land. In the meantime, the women were planting trees really to meet their felt needs, to have firewood, to have uh, building materials, to have fencing material, to have fodder for the animals. And, and sometimes people have said they have done studies where they say that the men sometimes will really refuse the women to cut the trees. I have never come across it. In all those 30 years I have been um, with the Green Belt Movement, I have never come across men who refused their women to cut the trees. Uh, but I have come across men who didn't want to be bothered until they got to understand the value of those trees. So that, uh, was for me very encouraging because although the movement is largely associated with the women, we were eventually able to make it a development project for the community. A commu we could sincerely say this is a community development project. It was not targeting specifically women. It is women driven, but it targets the community. And for us, this is a very important part of uh, of our equation, because we are a development project as well. And when we go into a community, we like to look at the entire community, men, women, and children, because you don't have communities of women, or communities of men, or communities only of children. Now, in the course of uh, our dis uh, working with, uh, with these women, uh, as I said, once we learned, we started teaching each other, and eventually we had literally thousands of small tree nurseries all over the, the place, and the women would be planting. Now, in order to sustain this, and in order to sustain their interest, and in order to make sure that they make the trees survive, because you can plant millions of trees, and if they don't take care of them, they will die. And so we wanted women to stay, or the communities to stay with the trees. So we introduced an element of an incentive so that for every tree that survived, the women got compensated. It was a very small compensation and much of the money that we raised actually goes to that compensation. It amounts to about a dollar to plant a tree. 
and the women get a small part of that. And because we are dealing with the poor in communities, and I haven't come across any woman in high heels planting trees. <laughs> it's usually poor women. And these women are very happy to have this income. It's not much of an income, but it makes a difference in their lives. And this money we discovered that this money is often invested in a family it for, for food, for education, uh, for clothing, uh, mostly domestic. And so it was a very, very important income for the family. And so for every seedling that survived, the women would be compensated. And that is the way the Green Belt Movement has continued to operate to this time. We have now moved very much from planting trees on private farms to, private, to plant, planting trees on public lands. This is mostly on school compounds, church compounds, uh, along rivers, and most importantly, in degraded forests. Now, for us to be able to approach the forest, we had a, a drama of sorts because we came to appreciate that one of the reasons why we were losing what volume of waters in rivers, or we were losing biodiversity, or we were losing rainfall, it's because the government was interfering with the forests. Remember I said that foresters are trained to have monocultures, and quite often these monocultures were being done at the expense of the indigenous forest. And this really interfered with the capacity of the forest to give us rainfall, to keep the rivers flowing, and all the other environmental services that you know forests give us. And so we started a campaign to educate people to understand that governments have a responsibility to manage the commons for the common good. That's what governments are for, to manage commons for the common good. <clears throat> but if members of government begin to privatize and own the common good, then they are not doing any good. And the, the, we had enough of them in our government. So we started agitating so that the government would stop destroying forests or privatizing forests or excising forests to give to their friends and colonies and supporters. And that's really what gave us a lot of uh, uh, bad publicity because sometimes we would be accused of being anti-government. But, but I want to share with you uh, some of the experiences that we got. When we would educate people in order for them to understand that forests and the environment generally is a concern for all of us. The same thing that we are now learning. That's what we were trying to teach the people. We would bring them and we would tell them that the environment is everything. And if the environment is destroyed, your life is destroyed. The lives of your children are destroyed. So it is in your interest that we protect the environment. And we would say, do you know who is destroying the environment? No. Okay, then we would say, you don't want to say it's the government because they will go and say, that they told us it is the government. <laughs> we wanted them to understand from within how their environment is being destroyed. So we would tell them, can you give us the problems you are facing in your communities? And we would list all the problems that they have. This is what we came to call civic and environmental education. We wanted them to understand how we govern ourselves and why the way we govern ourselves is bad for our environment and why therefore we needed to change our governance. At that time we were actually being uh, governed by a very dictatorial system that only allowed one political party. There was no competition. So they would give me all the problems. They thought I had a solution. So they would give me all the problems and there were many. And I would ask them, okay, these are all your problems. Where do you think these problems came from? And many of them would say, it is the government. It is the member of parliament. 
it is the religious leader. It is everybody except them. And our challenge now was to try to work with them to show them that there are certain things they do that destroy the environment. And that if you don't take care of your land, if you cut down trees, if you don't protect your land with the terraces, with the cut of drains, with the trenches, and the rains come, and your soil is taken away, so that you are left with infertile soils, and you plant your crops, and they fail, and you get starvation, well, has, the government has nothing to do with that, really. It's you. So you are the one who has to take action. So we would tell them, now, all these problems are a reflection of the fact that you are traveling in the wrong direction. And we would give an example of, for example, now I came from New York and I knew I had to come to La Guardia and take the right plane that will take me to Montreal. But if I was traveling like many of the people I was talking to who are completely traveling in the wrong direction, <laughs> I would have gone maybe to JF Kennedy and I would, uh, I, would have, I would have taken a plane going to Mexico. I know nothing, I don't know but in Mexico. If I land in Mexico, can you imagine the number of problems I would have? And I would, we would tell them, because traveling by bus was a very common, is a very common feature in Africa, for those of you who have been to Africa, we would use the bus. And he would say, we are traveling in a bus, we are in a bus, life is a, is a journey. And as we travel in this bus, we have come to a stop, and as we assess, we see we have a lot of problems that you have listed. It means you went to Mexico instead of Montreal. <laughs> we would use different cities. And we would ask them, can you give me any good reason why you would go to a bus stop and you take the wrong bus that eventually leads you to all these problems that you are now mentioning here? And we would struggle with them. Because as I said, the tendency is to blame a third party. But you want people to embrace personal responsibilities. You want people to be in charge of their lives. So we would struggle with them, and they would identify, almost without exception, in all the seminars, and we heard literally hundreds of seminars, we came up with the five reasons why they would say, they would give us the reasons why they went into the wrong bus. They would say, first and foremost, I could get into the wrong bus if I do not know. I just go into the bus, and it, uh, I go into a bus stop, and whichever bus has a door open, shh. <laughs> Ignorance can be a major reason why you enter into the wrong bus. Well, what is the other reason? Another reason that was often quoted was, if I'm misinformed, I can go to the bus stop, I ask for the direction, and I am misinformed. And God knows many of us are misinformed. Maybe we are misinformed by our parents, maybe we are misinformed by our leaders, maybe we are in misinformed by our religious leaders, maybe we are misinformed by books, Many of us are misinformed, and certainly those of us who live in the my region, we are very misinformed. So we take that, misinformed. If you do not ask, if you don't ask, you just enter whichever bus. Can't you stand and say, excuse me, which bus is going to Montreal? Yeah, many times we go through life, we don't ask. And the third one was, or the fourth one was, if you are not mentally alert, if you are drugged, quite often they would say, if you are drunk, or if you are drugged, 
Or if you have mental retardation, if you are a bit, as the Germans would say, verrucht, you would enter into the wrong path. And there are many people in this, in this world who are a bit verrucht. They go through life a bit dazed, and they don't know where they are going, so they enter any bus. And of course, end up with a lot of problems, more problems than they started with. The, the last reason that they gave, which to me was very, very significant, was fear. They said they feared. And of course, at that time, as I said, because we were living in a very dictatorial system, very oppressive system, we had no freedom of expression, we have no freedom of assembly, even those seminars were threatened, they were living in fear. And they said, if you have fear, you will get into the wrong bus. Now, what was amazing to me, what was amazing to me is that all those seminars never produced more than those five reasons. And when we would vote for which is the largest, which is the most impactful point, fear was the largest. And so we decided that we would join the pro-democracy movement. And we joined the pro-democracy movement in order to help change the system, in order to improve the democratic space, to bring in more freedom of the press, more freedom of expression, more freedom of assembly, so that we could have more political parties, so that we could have greater competition. And that eventually did happen. And many of you who followed Kenya's politics in the year 2002, we did, in the year 2000 and, um, 2000 and, uh, no, 1992, we reintroduced the multi-party system in Kenya. For the first time in about uh, 30 years, I think, that we had been locked up in one political party. And then we continued the struggling. It wasn't easy, even after introducing multi-party, it was still very difficult. It was not until, <clears throat> it was not until um, 2002 that we eventually managed uh, to remove the system that had been there and we reintroduced a new system and I had the privilege of being one of those members of parliament and joined the government at that point and thought that we had arrived. But to tell you the truth, we hadn't. <laughs> and we continued to struggle and especially we continued, continued to struggle because of the resistance of leaders to let go of dominance. And many leaders in Africa have used tribe as the vehicle to dominance. And so we continued to, even today, we continue to struggle to make people get out of their tribal cocoons and to see themselves more as members of the same society, to respect diversity, but not to be prisoners of their own communities so that we could uh, create a more democratic and a truly more diverse and more uh, tolerant society. And many of you who probably followed Kenya last year, you saw how it exploded. It had happened in 91, 90, 92, 97, but last year it exploded and it was nothing but a, 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 almost a culmination of these many years of struggle uh, with forces that do not want to let go of power, do not want to let go of um, uh, dominance, to, let, to allow for respect of human rights, to allow for diversity, to allow for respect for each other. And uh, the struggle continues. I know it is not only in Kenya, but the struggle continues. As far as our environment campaign is concerned, in many ways we have had one hand has been planting trees and the other hand has been working on changing society, especially changing the political system and changing, uh, expanding the democratic space. And it is in that process that, um, that we found it very necessary to get embraced, to get involved in campaigns such as, for example, the climate change. Now, the climate change, of course, is a, is a new thing that has come, has found us 
campaigning for the protection of the environment, but I know I should not finish without mentioning that the climate change, of course, has brought all of us again together. Because although the Industrial Revolution brought great changes and wonderful changes and made life better for millions of people on the planet, now we know that in the process, we also produced the so-called greenhouse gases. And now we are having to come together, we hope in Copenhagen, to agree that we need to change from fossil fuels to alternative sources of energy. For us in our part of the world, we are very horrified by the fact that we are being told by scientists that although we have not contributed much because we have been struggling all this time, we haven't really developed. So we have not contributed much in terms of greenhouse gases, but we are told Africa is going to be very negatively impacted by climate change. And one of the hope that we have is that we have forests. I'm the goodwill ambassador of the Congo forest. And we are hoping that especially the tropical forest will be embraced by Copenhagen and will become part of the solution. And we are hoping that unlike Kyoto discussions, uh, the United States of America is on board. At least it appears like it is on board. <laughs> And we are hoping that the American people will encourage their senators, especially we understand that uh, the House of Representatives is supportive, but the senators have yet to be convinced that we need to do something and that nothing much can be done if America and countries like Canada, countries like Britain, countries like Australia, or Japan, all these highly developed countries unless they are all on board. And I don't know to what extent Canada is on board. <clears throat> but it is very, very important that it be on board. It's also very important for us to, to agree that while the developing countries have the technology, have, have the capital, so if you really wanted to change your lifestyles, you could, because you could shift to other sources of energy, and you could use other sources of energy other than the fossil fuels. But for us in the developing world, we really don't have very much that we can do, except continue maybe to plant our trees, to protect the trees that are surviving, and to tell you that we will make sure that those forests will remain standing. So we are working with our governments and we are trying to convince gov governments that we must make these forests more valuable standing than cut. <laughs> and, so, and so we hope that this will happen. We, it's also for that reason that you know we started the Billion Tree Campaign with the United Nations Environment Program. I'm very happy because we started in 2006, and in 2006, in October, we said we want to plant at least a billion trees. And by the end of the year, we had planted a billion trees. I said, wow! <laughs> and we continued with the campaign, and I'm very, very, very happy to tell you that uh, last year we reached the three billion campaign and we said, oh no, my God, it's moving. And uh, just now in New York, the Chinese uh, government came forward and said that they had planted 2.6 billion. So in fact, we reached seven billion trees. <laughs> Japan, we went recently and we were talking about how do you, when you are in a rich country like Canada or like US or like Japan, how do you pass the message? It's very easy for me to pass the message in, in poor countries. But when I'm in rich countries, sometimes I'm lost. So I said, well, you know, I'm talking about reusing, reducing, recycling. And I said, you Japanese, you are using so many chopsticks. <laughs> are 
Berlin is not coming from the forest. They are probably coming from the Amazon, maybe from the Congo, maybe from Southeast Asia. Is there nothing you can do about it? And uh, it was really amazing because the Japanese told me that traditionally, because the Japanese, was, uh, they were living in a this small island and they had to do everything to conserve. They said traditionally, <clears throat> they actually had a custom, a traditional custom that was even embedded in their religion, which encouraged them to save, to conserve. And they called it Motainai. And they said, what I meant that you have to be very respectful of nature and of what nature gives you. That you have to show, demonstrate gratitude and you must not waste. And then I still ask them, and then, and what happened? <laughs> we abandoned it because we are now embarrassed to say. I said, well, the truth of the matter is, you may think that you have everything because you can buy. But Mutainai should really be your way of life, even today when you are very rich. You should be able to reuse, reduce, recycle. Because much of the resources you are utilizing are coming from other parts of the world. And you may not know, there are people who are being left starving so that you may have enough to use any waste. So can we start a campaign here to reuse, reduce, recycle Mutainai? <laughs> and now we have, uh, we have a fantastic campaign. We have a fantastic campaign in Japan, and we are trying to share that spirit. But I know the spirit of, of reuse, reduce is here uh, in North America. Uh, I heard about it many, many years ago. And in fact, when I came into the campus, I was so impressed. Look at this. It is part of the campaign. I don't have my glasses now, <laughs> but I know, what does it say? Can you read it for me? Because somebody read it for me. It says, and this is Concordia. Yeah, it's, uh, it was made by the Concordia Institute and other organizations, such as the Sustainable Action Fund, ASA, and other organizations. So, yes, reuse, uh, reduce, recycle. Re recycle. And the fourth one is Rethink. We have it here at Concordia. It's R4. It's one of the organizations working on sustainability as well. Well, that is really wonderful. So I'm not teaching you anything new. I'm so impressed. Really, I said, well, I, don't, I can go home. They have it. <laughs> it's so wonderful because sometimes people ask, what can I do? And, uh, and, and I know that, um, especially when you are young uh, and, and you are thinking, what will I do when I get out of school? There are so many issues. When you go into the classes, the professors, they, they talk about all the terrible things that are going on. The ice is melting, the seas will rise, people will migrate, and all the scenarios that we can think of. And you can easily be overwhelmed. And, uh, and, and that is the reason why I, I am so glad that um, the hummingbird story was told. How many of you have ever heard of that hummingbird story before? Oh, that's fantastic. Now, now I, I, like, uh, your name again is? Amin. Amin, my fellow African Amin. <laughs> As Amin said, it's not the big things, really. It's the little things you and I can do. Governments, and I'm very happy government, the government of Quebec is represented here. Part of the reason why I'm so encouraged to work in the Congo is because my co-chair for the Congo Fund is the former Prime Minister of Canada, uh, the Right Honorable Paul Martin, your own very committed man for the protection of the Congo forest. And uh, I went to see him yesterday and he showed me a very beautiful forest where he lives. I said, well, this is more beautiful than the Congo. The Congo trees don't change their leaves. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, it is what we as citizens can do. A telephone call. You are very lucky because you have huge democratic space. So you can call your leaders. You can tell them that 
They should be concerned about climate change. They should be concerned about the, the sinking islands in the Pacific. They should be concerned about the drought that is now hitting 10 million people in East Africa. They should be concerned about the fact that snow and ice is melting on Mount Kenya, on Kilimanjaro, in the Himalayas, in the Alps, at the poles. They should be concerned. And they are not being asked to do too much. And that we, the citizens, will support them. I had the privilege of addressing them at the United Nations just uh, last week. And what I said is, because I had been asked by the civil society to speak on their behalf, I said, I speak on behalf of the civil society, the citizens you lead. Because we can only appeal to you, our leaders, and tell you, don't, don't only think about the people within your borders. Go beyond your borders, because the greenhouse gases, they don't know any borders. And the, ri the rising seas, they don't know any borders. And in the climate uh, debate, we say polluter pays. There is a principle that says polluter pays. Whereas in this case, it's not the polluter who is paying. It is an innocent person in the Pacific whose island is now sinking because of greenhouse gases. So we need to talk to our leaders and we need to give them confidence that we are not going to refuse to vote for them. You know, they are afraid of losing the next time. <laughs> and most leaders think about the next election. They have to. So they need to feel that citizens care, that citizens appreciate this issue, that citizens want them to, Copenhagen, to go to Copenhagen and commit. And me as a person who is from the South, what can I say? I can only say like the hummingbird. And I want to ask you also to say like the hummingbird, because that's all we can be asked to do that we do wherever we are, whether we are professors or whether we are right honorable ministers or whether we are right honorable prime ministers, whether we are presidents, but especially when we are ordinary citizens, that we become that hummingbird, that we do not give up. No matter how many others are discouraging us, we keep at it, we keep at it, we keep at it. And every time we hear a discouraging word, we say to that word, we are doing the best we can. Thank you very much.